Hey everybody. So, the internet is a big place. If you've been around this channel for any bit of time, you know this already. But I feel like a lot of us kind of forget just how big it actually is. From its very early days, the internet has been constantly growing, changing, diversifying, and building up the unbelievably complex network of interconnected systems that it's become today. Over 5 billion people interacting daily during the course of over 30 years have created an almost unthinkable amount of information. More than any one person could even dream of seeing in one lifetime, or a thousand, or a million. But what we see on the surface of the internet today isn't exactly the whole picture. Say the World Wide Web was a city of sorts. Its glimmering spires and vibrant sky-piercing monoliths would hide beneath their growing shadows. A nearly endless network of sprawling slums, burnout districts, and long-buried catacombs. The abandoned, the obsolete, the forgotten. In less pretentious terms, there's a lot to the internet that we don't see, and a whole lot more that we just don't seem to care about anymore. Join me, if you will, as we take a look at the ruins and relics of the web. In the late 1990s, the internet was changing, and a bold new idea was sweeping the digital world. Social media technologies. Web 2.0 was just on the horizon, and early pioneering projects like Usenet, BBSs, and early chat rooms like The Palace had paved the way for a dramatic restructuring of how internet users interacted. In these early and uncertain times, four otherwise unrelated individuals were becoming increasingly aware of the internet's creep into daily life. Tech entrepreneur Chris Wolf was in the final year of his MBA at University of Southern California, paying particular interest to a course on tech and its involvement in media. Financer and owner of internet company E-Universe Brad Greenspan had recently launched an almost prophetically ahead of its time social site called LivePlace.com. Investor Josh Berman was doing Something, I don't know, there ain't much information about this guy online that isn't coded in a layer of pretentious business talk. And UC Berkeley graduate and former hacker Tom Anderson had recently moved back from a stay in Taiwan to California in order to study film at UCLA. While pursuing this degree in 2000, Anderson would begin working as a product tester for the online storage platform xDrive, where he would meet Chris DeWolf for the first time. After xDrive went bankrupt during the dot-com crash of 2001, Anderson and DeWolf would form the short-lived direct marketing company ResponseBase. A year later, the company would be sold to Brad Greenspan's eUniverse, which had survived the crash under Greenspan's oversight, and both Anderson and DeWolf would become employees. But in 2003, everything would change. You see, the big name in social media at the time, by far, was Friendster. The California-based social networking platform had been founded in 2002, and it served to fill the gap left by defunct turn-of-the-millennium sites like SixDegrees.com. Friendster had several million registered users after only a year of operation, and was quickly rising in popularity with very few competitors. Our four individuals, however, had slightly different plans. Seeing potential in Friendster's networking capabilities, but being dissatisfied with a number of its features, including how the site banned accounts not using real names, Anderson and company began work quickly developing their own version of a social media platform. Financially supported by Greenspan and Josh Berman, and partially based on a prototype site created by Wolf during his time at USC, the group created an early version of the site 
called MySpace over the course of 10 days in August 2003. MySpace was unique in that while it did promote individual interactions like many platforms at the time, it also boasted extreme customizability and the promise of being able to promote and express oneself in the spirit of earlier web fixtures like GeoCities, but we'll talk about that in a bit. After bringing on a team of developers, the MySpace project, with Tom Anderson as its official president and unofficial mascot, used the sizable reach of eUniverse to promote its services to millions of potential users worldwide. The site quickly grew and would eclipse its spiritual forefather, Friendster, as early as April 2004. Everybody you knew had a MySpace, and it was rapidly becoming a household name. So for now, let's let MySpace do its thing and take a step back in time to look at some much earlier internet phenomena that formed the fabric of the internet's creative spirit before gradually, but inexplicably, vanishing. was brought online in the 1990s. While early predecessors to the World Wide Web concept like ARPNET, Usenet, and BBS had existed for decades, and the web itself was officially born in 1989, you have to understand that its original inhabitants were a very select group of people, and very few in number. For the first few years of its existence, the population of the internet was almost entirely academics, researchers, engineers, and university students, the combined number of which could be counted in the single digit millions at most, less than a tenth of a percent of its current count. But this would all change in the early to mid 90s. Internet service providers like Prodigy, CompuServe, Delphi, and AOL went public and began heavily promoting their services, offering people who'd never even heard of the internet before access to an amazing world they previously could have only imagined. Web browsers like Mosaic and Netscape Navigator made the technically intricate affair of exchanging HTTP requests and accessing web servers something that anybody could take part in. Thanks to these two staggering shifts in the dynamic of the web, many millions of brand new internet users came online in 1993 and 94, and this number increased exponentially in the years to come. To prospective users, the internet was billed not just as a tool to increase efficiency and a method of communicating, but a nearly endless digital canvas where users could create almost anything they saw fit. As human beings, we like to express ourselves, and one of the best ways to do this is to create and one way or another. The internet made this easier than it had ever been. But how exactly did people do this? Well, today you make an account or a channel or a profile on some massive site to share whatever's on your mind. But back then, you made a website. Doing this was surprisingly easy. Services like Angelfire, Tripod, GeoCities, and more offered users what were essentially their own free websites, with which users could do pretty much whatever they wanted. If you knew a bit about backend web development, you could even do it on your own. This freedom to make any site imaginable came to encompass just about everything you could possibly think of, and probably some things that you can't. I mean, this was the Wild West. Just doing research for this video, I found a site aggregating all the worst movies the site admin had ever seen, a gallery of photos from an air show in Germany, a site called 101 Reasons Men Suck, a page dedicated to a guy named Daniel Greenhouse and the fact that he ate a durian fruit in 1988, and so much more. Some of it was stream of consciousness. People would make a page on their site for every little thing they happened to think of, and it didn't necessarily have to be organized in any way either. Some of it was creative, people posting updates on books they were writing, sharing games they'd created, or asking for feedback on their art. Some of it was literally just home pages for a single person. Some still was fandom-centric, fan sites devoted to gorillas, Jimmy Neutron, Sega Tessandro, Roller Coaster Tycoon, Blink-182, I could literally go on for days. In general, they had an overall look that today would probably be described as crusty. They were without a doubt rough around 
around the edges, but that was entirely part of their charm, and it's this look that became synonymous with late Web 1.0 and early 2.0 in years to come. One of the best things about these sites was the fact that they'd often link to each other, so if you played your cards right, you could jump from one to the next to the next to the next all day long, and you could never run out of new sites to visit. And you know what, while we're here, there's a few that I just gotta share. Aggregator of every Garfield comic built with XHTML 1.0. Page dedicated to this one guy named Tim Brown. Site about, I think, angels from space trying to stop Saurians from hell from enslaving humanity via RFID chips and barcodes. Chicken Farm Guide, Alan Rickman Fan Page, Zango Bob's Blowtorch Heaven. Like I said, everything and anything you could possibly think of. These sites form their own interconnected ecosystem of individuals shouting their hopes and dreams into the void to be received by anyone who is listening. But as the 2000s marched on, something strange began to happen. One by one, these sites were abandoned. Whether brought on by the encroach of major social media platforms or the decline of personal sites as a web phenomenon, these unique web pages slowly ceased their development. If you visit one of these sites today, chances are you'll find disheartening reminders of just how long it's been floating, untouched, on a vast digital sea. Even worse are those completely lost, shut down by users no longer interested in maintaining them, or removed by a service provider no longer receiving payments. GeoCities went down in its entirety in 2009, taking with it millions of these user-generated pages to the depths below. Whether abandoned, removed, or lost entirely, a staggering amount of these early bastions of online self-expression have been almost completely buried beneath the sands of time, and there are many that will likely never be discovered again. But wait a minute, don't let me get you down, because it's not always as bad as it seems. One of the most surprising things I discovered while browsing these sites wasn't actually how many had been defunct since the mid-2000s, but was in fact just how many were still being updated to this day. I found sites originally created around the turn of the millennium that had been diligently monitored, updated, and cared for by a single individual for 20 years. Sites that looked straight out of 2001 with the last post date of September 2022. It's easy to see how much of the early web has been lost or abandoned, but it's equally easy to forget just how much of it remains quietly but unshakably intact, kept alive by the patience and care of those who refuse to stop casting their hopes and dreams into the digital night. If this kind of thing interests you, I'd recommend Wibby.me. I'm not sponsored or anything, but it's this fun little stripped back search engine that specifically indexes old school web pages and ignores most modern ones. It's an incredibly interesting way to get an unfiltered glimpse back in time and view sites that are otherwise almost impossible to find, whether active or abandoned. I gotta admit, it's a strange feeling seeing the visitor account bar tick up for the first time since 2005. And you know, that's a good time as any to jump back in. By 2005, MySpace was king of social media. The site had skyrocketed in popularity following its release, and by that year it was seeing 16 million monthly users. As is almost expected in our modern age, the MySpace team soon received a $580 million buyout from News Corporation, then owners of 20th Century Fox and other numerous properties. The group accepted, and within a year the company had already earned News Corp triple its purchase price. Throughout the mid to late 2000s, MySpace became the single most visited site on the entire internet, more a household name than any social media platform to come before it. Entering 2006, the company began to heavily focus on expansion outside the United States, with the 100 millionth account being created in the Netherlands in August of that year. And with this worldwide acclaim and universal notoriety came diversity never before seen. 
everybody was on MySpace. People were using it not only like they had once used personal web pages, but also to date, to post their pictures, to share news with others, upload video content, and interestingly enough, promote their creative ventures. This was something not often seen before this point. The general idea of social networking site was for individual people to interact and meet. However, MySpace not only allowed, but encouraged people and groups to promote their endeavors, most notably musicians. You have to remember, this is an era where sites like SoundCloud, Bandcamp, and even YouTube were either hazy ideas in the minds of their creators, or in a very early stage that offered little promise to music producers. So, to up-and-coming musicians eager to promote their works to a greater online audience, MySpace was hands down the way to go. Fallout Boy, Panic at the Disco, Black Veil Brides, and a number of other quintessentially mid to late 2000s musical groups all got their start promoting their music in MySpace's hollowed halls. The customizability the site afforded to its users, along with the fact that you could spotlight music by having it literally play all over your personal page, allowed MySpace to become a sort of fusion community when it came to music, an ecosystem where a band could not only promote its works, but also accumulate a fan base centered around them on the same same site. Millions of tracks by artists ranging from wildly successful to virtually unknown were uploaded during the site's most popular and influential years, the mid to late 2000s. And alongside over 115 million users, this wealth of content brought the site's net worth to over 12 billion circa 2007. But as it would turn out, this would be the group's peak. They would soon be battered by a storm of conflicts from outside and within. The rapid growth of the company since its very beginnings had exerted constant stress on both its human resources and its technical ones, and towards the end of the 2000s, MySpace was struggling to keep up with the influx of user data and to continue adding new features. However, an even bigger threat loomed on the horizon. A small social media startup that had largely been relegated to college campuses in years prior, but had recently begun to make frighteningly quick advances into MySpace's user base. A site called Facebook.com. In a twist of events that seems oddly common in stories like this, it's alleged that MySpace turned down an offer to buy Facebook for less than 100 million circa 2005. And this decision was beginning to turn on them, as Facebook officially eclipsed MySpace's user base in numbers during 2008. While it's true MySpace offered more freedom and customizability, Facebook had a stripped-back, slick interface and a more mainstream, universal appeal when compared to MySpace, which had become increasingly centered around alternative communities. Between Facebook's rise, the company's crumbling digital infrastructure, and the development of a wider range of social media sites including Twitter, MySpace was no longer at the top of the social network. Alongside the site's growing negative reputation for spam, malware, and sexually explicit content, many of the site's former users began to migrate elsewhere, as much of MySpace's original team abandoned ship and half of both its user base and employees were axed. News Corp sold the site for a fraction of its purchasing price in 2011, being jointly purchased by Specific Media Group and singer Justin Timberlake. The site would change hands a number of times and receive numerous coats of paint, most focused on emphasizing its music element, in an effort to revitalize the withering service. But users continued to dwindle and MySpace fell largely out of the public eye. By the late 2010s, MySpace, while still online and fully functional, existed in the minds of most as only a distant, nostalgic memory. So it should come as no surprise that when, in 2018, the company quietly began a server migration effort to redistribute its decades of user data, very few individuals took note. So while the data transfers, let's take another quick break to look at some videos. Come on. YouTube could be considered the first of its kind. 
Early live digital video prototypes like the Trojan Room coffee pot feed had proven that video streaming was a technical possibility, and data compression methods developed in the late 80s and early 90s allowed streaming to become a semi-viable avenue for development. But for the longest time, the technology just wasn't there yet. A 1993 live-streamed concert by Xerox in crystal clear 152 by 76 pixel resolution took up, quote, half the total bandwidth of the entire internet, and most live streams and video uploads of the time were seen as major events. Even as the tech slowly came around throughout the late 90s and hosting video on the web became a feasible concept, there just didn't seem to be a huge amount of demand for it. Why would internet users want videos when they had crusty photos and midis? Up to and into the early 2000s, only a handful of video sharing sites would emerge. The biggest leap came with the release of Adobe Flash and subsequently sites like Newgrounds, although these were exclusively designed for animated media. No, when YouTube first hit the scene in February 2005, after a brief stint as a dating site, it really was something unique. The general motive of the site's founders and former PayPal employees Chad Hurley, Steve Chen, and Jawed Karim was to make video sharing and viewing easy and enjoyable, so as to allow anyone on the internet to upload whatever they wanted whenever they want. The site was purchased by Google roughly a year later in 2006, and the rest, as they say, is history. YouTube, in its formative years, had a community and culture very indicative of the time it emerged from. Broadcast Yourself was emblazoned across the homepage of the site, and the drive to strike out and make something entirely unique that defined the early internet was found within the very foundations of YouTube's community. Across the years, the site saw countless individuals rise and fall, but each started just about the same, making weird videos on the internet for other people to watch. But in recent years, as you're probably all aware, the site's seen a steady and disheartening creep away from its roots. The gradual inflation and oversaturation of content brought on by millions upon millions of users has made the online rags to riches story a rarity, and a long series of site reforms that have proven controversial and, in this writer's opinion, really fucking stupid, have tarnished the site's reputation and further discouraged its user base. But hey, that's never really stopped anyone, has it? We're always gonna make videos, if for no other reason than to say that we went out there and did it. Hell, on this channel I've been putting 40-ish hours into each video for two years now and seeing a couple thousand views per video. But as long as I can continue to make things I'm proud of, and as long as there are people who receive joy from it, I'll keep on keeping on. Regardless of how unwelcoming or barren YouTube's environment becomes, the creative spirit never truly dies, and users will continue to create something that's uniquely their own, even if it doesn't seem like anyone will ever see it. But that brings us to a strange little paradox that YouTube has presented. The strange case of the unseen video. When you upload something to YouTube, it joins the ranks of billions upon billions of others uploaded in the past 17 years. With that in mind, it'd be easy to assume the chances of your video getting views are slim to none. But consider this for a moment. Upon upload, every video has no views. But how many times have you seen a video uploaded a year ago or more that hasn't gained any views at all? Chances are very few. The web service PetitTube specifically indexes YouTube videos with no views, ironically giving them a view in the process. But if you spend any good bit of time flicking through videos on that site, you'll notice the only videos to meet this criteria are mere weeks or even days old. Even the most bizarre and obscure channels, and believe me, I've seen obscure, even those manage to accumulate a handful of views, maybe a couple likes or even a comment, as the months and years eventually tick on. Personal channels from the late 2000s, old computer-generated internet personalities, tiny countdown channels probably made by children that were never supposed to make it outside a small friend group. While the massive quantity of users makes it considerably harder to make a name for yourself, it also has the somewhat unexpected side effect of ensuring that there will always be someone to watch your videos. In a way, it's reassuring to know that no matter what it is you upload or no matter how you personally feel about it, there will always be someone out there to give it a watch. They may not find it today, tomorrow, or the next day, but like so many of these forgotten personal channels of years gone by, one day your videos will be seen. If you're lucky, then by some quirk of the algorithm it may be seen by millions. But whether or not it is, the one thing you can know for certain is that the light of your video will one day fall upon the eyes of another. And this is something we can all take comfort in.
But we've spent enough time here. Let's get back to that data transfer. Something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. At first, nothing is really noticed. The site appears to be functioning normally, and all is well. But on February 1st of 2018, a Reddit user named JodyXD makes a post on the r slash tech support community. MySpace player won't play songs, and I want to download them if possible. Jody went on to post a follow-up in the comments, sharing a response they received from MySpace support. There is an issue with all songs slash videos uploaded over three years ago. We are aware of the issue, however, there is no exact time frame for when this will be completed. Somehow, during the data migration, an error had occurred, preventing media from prior to 2015 from playing on the site at all, and technicians were apparently stumped. But the news would get worse just a few months later. On July 30th of 2018, a user named Austin Jackson posted a comment on the thread showing their own response for MySpace support, this time featuring a message far more dire. Yes, this is true. Due to a server migration, files were corrupted and unable to be transferred over to our updated site. There is no way to recover the lost data. Thanks, MySpace. A few more months down the line, Jason Scott, the owner of archival site textfiles.com, posted about the data loss on Twitter, and the story was picked up by major news agencies within days. MySpace, in one fell swoop, had managed to completely and utterly lose almost every single piece of user-uploaded media posted between 2003 and 2015, most notably user-created music, one of the site's most beloved features during its peak. Users were shocked, saddened, and understandably outraged. MySpace had not only lost a decade of memories in the form of digital media, but ironically had driven the final nail into its own coffin of eventual obscurity, ensuring that even those users with fond memories of the site would never again return, knowing that everything they remembered the site for had been lost forever. It seemed MySpace would join the ever-growing ranks of the internet's forgotten and obscure, although its case was a special one considering it had all but pushed itself into that corner. But this isn't quite where the story ends. Around a year later, it was announced that between 2008 and 2010, a research team had aggregated roughly 500,000 tracks from MySpace for a study. While this was only around 1% of the 50 million tracks originally lost, it was a welcome piece of good news for users who thought they would never see their music again. The group set up an indexable and searchable repository for these tracks, hosted by the Internet Archive, responsible for utilities like the Wayback Machine. With this small but invaluable collection as a starting point, users began to raid every archive, hard drive, and abandoned site they could get their hands on in the hopes of finding more of these now lost pieces of internet culture. And the search continues today, with more songs being added by the week. Old MySpace users who had almost completely forgotten about their history with the site could now return to search through the growing archive and maybe, just maybe, find an audio time capsule of an era fondly remembered by so many. While it's extremely unlikely the entire lost library will ever be found, that sure as hell hasn't stopped anyone from trying, and the progress they've made so far gives former MySpace users hope for the future. And such ends the tale of the rise, fall, and ruinous demise of MySpace. The internet is a big, weird, kind of annoying place. With the constant bombardment of information we're faced with on the web of today, it can be easy to dismiss it as just another mundane aspect of everyday life to take at face value and no deeper. But the further you look into it, the more you start to realize that the history and culture of the internet is, in many ways, just as diverse and detailed as that of the real world. 
After all, what is the internet if not a whole bunch of people doing what they do over the course of days, months, and years? A social gathering of monolithic scale that's created things we previously couldn't have dreamed of, and probably some things we wouldn't have wanted to dream of in the first place. But I digress. With such a complex interwoven net of communications and interactions, it's understandable, even predictable, that so much of it would end up inevitably buried, destroyed, and forgotten. From fallen social media titans to ancient personal sites of years gone by, to the silent glowing sentinels of the web's most obscure and isolated videos, the internet really becomes something like an iceberg. The real, genuine bulk of it isn't where we all can see. It's below the surface, waiting for years if it has to, for someone or something to find it, provided they know the right place to look. The ruins of the web maintain their silent vigil. They've waited 30 years, and they can wait 30 more, if need be. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've been up all night, and I really gotta get to bed. Thanks for watching.